his poetry collection, The Voyage to Eternity, poet, educator, and humanitarian Preeth Nambia wrote that perhaps one of the greatest means to achieve global peace and harmony is cultural exchange. It opens up the vistas of human understanding and further expands our universal consciousness. Throughout history and the present day, societal progress has often been associated with cultural interaction, in which cultures engage in dialogue through conquest and material and an intellectual exchange. This exchange has become more prevalent than ever thanks to new media, globalization, and technological developments, raising discussions but also controversies on how cultural competency and social awareness should be displayed in an increasingly interconnected world. My name is Helen Fung, and I'm an aspiring composer-performer passionate about social and cultural studies. I was born in New Zealand and raised in China. I'm a Buddhist who attends weekly services at a congregational church as a choir member, a student at a liberal arts boarding school in Massachusetts, and previously at an international bilingual school in Shenzhen, China. These experiences of cultural hybridity have collectively shaped my values and identity and instilled in me a curiosity to explore the dynamic cultures that piece together the complex mosaic of humanity. A creative project from my Asia and World History class last year inspired me to carry these first thoughts into action. The assignment was to produce a creative work of any genre that draws inspiration from an art form originating from India, China, or the Middle East. What's required was an extensive research process and a tinge of creative originality. So I decided to compose a piece that merges some central elements of Indian raga music, Arabic maqam music, and Chinese folk music against the backdrop of a Western instrumentation and structure. The idea was to explore the fundamental universality of mankind across boundaries of faith and ethnicity. During my research process, um, I encountered the American composer and multi-instrumentalist Yusuf A. Latif's repository of scales and melodic patterns, which cataloged many global musical patterns from around the world arranged into Western tuning system and notation. Those included Japanese polytetrachords, Arabian scales from Isfahan and Iraq, Western church modes, Persian scales, Chinese pentatonic scales, Hindustani raga scales, among many more. I found it so fascinating to see how different arrangements of musical notes can exude feelings specific to a certain culture. But browsing through this anthology, I questioned, if I, an outsider of Indian, Middle Eastern, and even Western cultures, incorporate these scales into my own music and adapt them for creative purposes, am I being a cultural appropriator, a concept that a classmate suggested to me after the performance? In other words, what is cultural property? What does it mean to appropriate elements of another culture? Under what circumstances can borrowing potentially become exploitative? According to Oxford reference, cultural appropriation is the taking over of creative or artistic forms, themes, or practices by one cultural group from another. Inescapably tied to social politics, this concept used to often refer to Western appropriations of non-Western or non-white forms and carries connotations of exploitation and dominance. By conventional definition, members of systematically um, oppressed or marginalized culture are not susceptible to appropriating elements of a systematically dominant culture in the process of survival and assimilation. Now, notice the first thing that comes into mind when you hear the term cultural appropriation. Perhaps it is an image like this. Like this, like this. Or in literature, the use of colloquialism specific to a certain culture by an author who is a cultural outsider. But interestingly, music appears to be a seldom discussed component in mainstream conversations surrounding cultural appropriation, despite its arguable tendency to present cultures in highly simplified manners. The ease of imitating, borrowing, and adapting musical material from around the world 
and the complex realities of profit, commercialization, representation, and power dynamics in the industry itself. Like many of you, I reflected on where the boundary between appropriation and appreciation sits, how an artist can draw inspiration and depict a cultural other through informed ways that do not limit creativity. And seeing respect, empathy, and awareness as the central themes of today's cultural appropriation debate, I will express through the lenses of music that although we live in a society in which such accusations abound, an artist should be encouraged to tell a story beyond their personal experience with one, a respectful intent, two, a thorough consideration of impact, and three, an awareness of contextual complexities such as representation, commercialization, and power dynamics. Using several examples from across different genres of music, I will illustrate how adopting this multifaceted mindset can foster informed cultural dialogue and reduce stereotypical barriers in an increasingly interconnected world, and thus maximizing the benefits of cultural exchange. In the 1960s, the Beatles emerged as one of the most influential rock groups in the history of popular music. In April 1965, George Harrison found interest in Hindustani classical music upon hearing a group of Indian musicians playing their traditional instruments on the sets of the Beatles film, Help. He then began his decades-long studies and partnership with the, with the star maestro, Pandit Ravi Shankar, and the Beatles, led by Harrison's commitment, they traveled to northern India to study transcendental meditation and proceeded to release many Indian-inspired songs, often incorporating Indian instruments played by Harrison himself. A classic example would be Strawberry Fields Forever, a song that depicts John Lennon's childhood memories of playing at the Strawberry Field Garden at a Salvation Army Children's Home, close to where he grew up in Liverpool. This song features Harrison playing a swarmandal, an Indian harp, to evoke a hazy, impressionistic dream world, according to George Martin, the band's producer. John Lennon also famously described the song as psychoanalysis set to music. Um, here's an idea of what it sounds like. Strawberry feels forever. In another song, Tomorrow Never Knows, John Lennon also drew inspiration from his experiences uh, with the hallucinogenic drug LSD and merged Indian-inspired microtones, the rhythmic patterns of the tabla, and the drone textures played by the sitar, the tambura, and the bass guitar to illustrate an LSD trip through psychedelic rock. <laughs> So, as deeply as these songs connected to the Beatles' personal worlds, yes, they, are, they connect so deeply to the Beatles' personal worlds and present so many instructive elements for future artists to come. But despite the Beatles' intents of appreciation and respect for Indian music and spirituality, art's intrinsic ties to social politics made controversy inevitable. People debated as to whether the Beatles could have furthered Orientalist tendencies of exotifying the East through using Indian instruments to evoke a sense of exotic splendor and hallucination. People debated as to whether the Beatles could have furthered Orientalist tendencies through tying Indian music and instrumentation with a sense of drugs hallucination, and exoticism, especially after 200 years of British imperialism in India, the Beatles' choice of subject in their Indian-inspired songs added to the complexity of impact and context. Now, Orientalism defined in the 1970s by Edward Said, a professor at Columbia University, highlights Westerners' widespread tendency to focus on despotism, splendor, cruelty, and cultural stagnance, as well as sensuality in their depictions of the Orient. This concept is no stranger to the history of 
Western music, from Mozart's Rondo a la Turca, Rondo in the Turkish style, to the exotic sounding Arabian and Chinese tea dances in Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker, to the Italian composer Giacomo Puccini's opera Torandot, which is set in mythical Peking and features a beautiful yet cruel Chinese princess as its protagonist. And now the Beatles, according to Gordon Thompson, author of Please Please Me, 60s British pop Inside Out, invented their own Orientalist vision of Indian culture through tying Indian music to drugs and sex. So as central as they were, in spreading oriental aesthetics and spirituality to the, 19, uh, to the Western world in the 1960s, might it be possible that the Beatles had engaged in cultural appropriation, also taking into account the complex realities of profit, commercialization, and power dynamics? At the age of 27, the French composer Claude Debussy acquainted himself with the music of central Java, Indonesia, known as Gamelan, at the 1889 Paris Exposition. And so began a movement that would radically transform the Western art scene even to this day. Fascinated by the unique timbre and tuning system and hypnotic sounds of the gamelan, the composer allegedly returned to the Dutch East Indies Pavilion for the next few days to hear the Indonesian musicians perform and to study <laughs> Indonesian tuning, gamelan tuning and structure. In 1913, Debussy wrote in a newspaper article that the Gamelan school consists of the eternal rhythm of the sea, the wind in the leaves, and a thousand other tiny noises, which they listen to with great care, without ever having consulted any of those dubious treatises. Javanese music obeys laws of counterpoint, which makes our own music not much more than a barbarous kind of noise more fit for a traveling circus. The composer's fascination with the genre only grew in time, with his incorporation of gamelan percussive patterns into his Pola Piano Suite. In another piano composition, Pagodis, Debussy also imitated the sound of gamelan bells and gongs and the open intervals of the slendro tuning system within the confines of the Western tuning system. But the Paris exposition that featured these skilled artists from central Java, Indonesia, among other regions, was staged by the French government to celebrate the diverse cultures and resources under French colonial possession, including those of French Indonesia. According to Dr. Shamim Black from the Department of Gender, Culture, Media and Cultural Studies from the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific, cultural appropriation is not necessarily so much about cross-cultural engagement as it is an indication of a strong split that's going on between how enthusiastically a culture or product or process from a part of a world is received and how enthusiastically the people from that region are received. In the centuries to come, more composers across the Western Hemisphere would draw inspiration from the Indonesian gamelan following Debussy's lead, of course, out of intents of appreciation. For instance, Debussy's close contemporary Poulenc, 1960s minimalists John Cage and Steve Reich, and contemporary composers like Evan Zipporin and Georgie Ligeti, just to name a few. Gamelan influences can even be found in today's EDM rhythmic foundations. It has become so thoroughly integrated into the global music scene with over 100 gamelan ensembles based in the United States alone. The process of gamelan westernization is testament to how the spread of an art form rooted in oppression has carried its relevance to this day and prompts the necessity of more empathy, dialogue, and awareness than ever. Now, these examples come together to illustrate that intent, impact, and context are all indispensable thought processes towards an informed depiction of any cultural other.
But conventional debates surrounding cultural appropriation are so often based on the perception of cultures as singular stagnant artifacts of clearly defined boundaries. But in reality, cultures are complex and they change over time. They are, not, they are dynamic processes that do not merely participate in appropriation, but are themselves composed of appropriation. Richard A. Rogers, from the uh, Professor of Communication Studies at Northern Arizona University, remarked that a model of culture as separate entities and distinct wholes is not only empirically questionable, but also complicit in the subordination of primitive cultures. So how can these rigid definitions of culture interact with the growing climate of cultural hybridity and intersection in the 21st century? How should society strike a balance between historical realities and the complex and changing nature of power distribution in a changing world? Being an Asian, I'm part of a group that has been historically subjected to oppression and therefore, by conventional definition, not susceptible to appropriating another culture. But this does not mean that the multifaceted approach of respect, empathy, and awareness does not apply to me and my artistic pursuits. These observations led me to think of a model with power dynamics constantly changing and cultural intersections so fluid that they become interpersonal. What remains constant is the power of a res sincerely respectful intent and an empathy-driven consideration of what story is being told and received and under what context. This mindset is not just necessary for artistic pursuits, but also serves as a vital skill set in today's diversified social setting. And as an aspiring artist, I decide to embrace possibilities by giving credit to the cultures, individuals, and ideas that are not my own, but inspire me. Because according to Yo-Yo Ma, when we enlarge our view of the world, we deepen our own understanding of our own selves. Thank you.